Hello, I am Lauren. And I'm Oliver. And you're listening to Optimism of the Well, the gayest, most transgender in podcast, this side of the left. Oliver, today's topic, it's uh, sometimes what happens when you move left is that you figure out more and more of how the world works and eventually it ends up, it ends up alienating you from, <laughs> from from the world you grew up in. We are broadly indoctrinated into a neoliberal worldview. This idea that capitalism is correct, that there are no systemic injustices. And that meritocracy is real. Yeah, yeah. All all the all the baggage that comes with believing in in our uh our neoliberal world order. And you know, sometimes sometimes that's really freaking alienating from the world around you um i thought where we could start was like one when, when was the earliest moment where you found yourself moving leftward and then you found that that was creating friction with other people or other aspects of your life oh my gosh so i know i've talked about this on the podcast before mm-hmm but the first time I, I think I noticed it causing like a very significant social problem in my life was whenever the LGBT organization that I volunteer at, whenever the libertarian lady there was letting the Department of Corrections march at Pride Fest. That was a really, really big deal to me, especially given the circumstances um, with uh, transphobic bills just very recently being passed. And, you know, a lot of people at the LGBT organization sort of reacted as though I was making a very big deal out of nothing or like they didn't have the framework to understand why I was so upset. And that was like really, really frustrating because a lot of these people are always, you know, they're they're queer they're mostly white, of mm. course, mm. Um, and they kind of put a big show on about how progressive they are, how like virtuous they are, like unironic actual virtue signaling, you know, these kinds of people. And so I, I think for a lot of progressive liberals, they kind of have this idea that like they don't have any more work to do. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever you kind of bring up the like, hey, actually, this is, this does not align with my values. I am more far left than you are. What you're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. They they do take it very badly. Honestly, I've noticed in my experience, there's no way to sit down and like with a liberal mm -hmm. to sit down and just say, hey, actually, like, I think you're great in a lot of ways. You know, I love hanging out with other trans people. I think you're funny, et cetera. Um, I enjoy your company overall, but but when push comes to shove, I feel like I can't trust you and that our values don't align because you're not a socialist, you're not a leftist. Um, they don't they don't take it well. Um, I think they feel like you're calling them immoral. Like you're criticizing their values and they lack the framework to understand what they're missing and why you could be passing this judgment onto them. Um, so like having having a lot of liberals in my life um, has been has been really challenging in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I know what you mean. I um you know, like, for example, a lot of my friends, um, they're like small business owners and, you know, they're broadly liberal. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, pay your employees fair wages and give them health benefits, blah, 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 all that jazz. And it's like, and then I'll have to be like, no, see, the problem is we have a class based society. You owning the business is kind of the problem. <laughs> and and, you know, that is uh, it's, it's an um, it's a personal affront to them. Uh, when you bring up this, like, you know, like you were saying, this idea that what they're doing could be interpreted as immoral. Um, they basically go, oh, so you think I'm a bad person. Yeah. They take it very personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, a lot of landlords are like this. They think, 
they think they're just like, you know, some guy surviving under capitalism. No, what you're doing is capitalism. You're what the problem is. You know, like my, I had, I had a, a, a liberal therapist once and he tried to, uh, I was complaining about landlords and he was like, isn't that guy just trying to survive under capitalism? And I was like, no, no, he's not. He's, he's, he's a scalper of houses. Like, like people scalp Taylor Swift tickets, but, but with a necessity, if this was like, if there was like a friggin' baby food shortage and you were withholding food from babies so you could sell it at a profit we would recognize that as immoral but when it comes to housing it's like oh he's just a businessman he's taking a risk no this is what the problem with society is you know i've paid more than forty thousand on this duplex i've been living at like i should own this place you're literally paying for it <laughs> you know your landlord is taking your money to pay off his mortgage and he gets to keep the house I'm sure it's already paid off by now. Yeah, it's nonsense. It's 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 fragrantly like it's it's bonkers, but that's what I'm kind of getting at. It's like you understand how more of how the world works and then it it starts creating this friction between uh you and and the world around you. Like like a lot of the time I find it really hard to enjoy liberal media because they're so brain rotted with their their liberal ideals um and it comes out in how they make art like like i remember um did you did you see season three of legend of Korra? i didn't get that far into it because i got so frustrated by it so the first enemy was like a communist amon yes and he was also i feel like he was really analyzing a class problem and like potentially like a eugenics problem right or a disability problem where functionally um in in the legend of Korra, which is the sequel to avatar the last airbender mm -hmm. some people have the ability to manipulate the elements you know moving with great force huge chunks of rock um like manipulating fire or water mm -hmm. And people who cannot do these things in this world, I think, are functionally disabled. There are a lot of jobs that they cannot do. The mm -hmm. other, you know, people who can bend can do this type of labor. So I think, I don't know if they talked about it in season one, because it's been a couple of years since I watched it. Um, but the guy, Amon, wasn't he talking about like non-benders having less economic opportunity as well even if he didn't bring it up it's like that's almost certainly a thing that was happening or would happen in that kind of yeah. situation that kind of society right mm -hmm. so like this guy like everything he was saying was correct where he's like basically a civil right like a radical civil rights leader for non-benders and like demanding equality for that type of person and then at the end of the season they kind of you know they did that thing that they do in almost every like fictional especially like superhero type media where a left wing um baddie the antagonist like eventually he goes crazy he goes too far yeah. the lefties always go too far man <laughs> and then they they just like unceremoniously blow him up like he just blows up in a boat on like the season finale yeah um and it's kind of just like all right now we get to go back to our our neoliberal utopia yeah. Where, you know, benders and non-benders have um, unequal opportunities and that's just how it is. The, the day is saved. Changes. Yeah, nothing changes. And that show is like really weird. Like the left wing villains got treated way worse than the right wing villains. Like uh, uh, Zaheer, for example. 
Shit, I didn't even think about that. I don't know. I'm thinking of at the end of Avatar The Last Airbender that they just take away the bending of Ozai, right? Like, yeah. oh, you can't bend anymore. But the left wing villain, they fucking blow him up. Yeah, Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> My God. Yeah, no, they treat they treat. Um, but that's that's what that's what liberalism is. It's like it's like um, it's the nice face of fascism. Basically. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you got this reminds me of playing Disco Elysium and you're talking with Joyce, who describes herself as the ultra an ultra liberal. And you know, interpersonally she's very nice. But like she is she arrives in the game as the hammer of this massive corporation like she shows up with armed soldiers to put down a workers strike but she's, she's lovely not just to you. nice she gives you money yeah money. she's very charming oh also. she's so charming yeah i i wanted to bring up this quote that i told you about recently lauren by a holocaust survivor named thomas blatt mm-hmm. he was um captive in a concentration camp called Sobibor. And you talking about like the smiling face of liberalism or really like the smiling face of fascism, right? Mm -hmm. Um, He said, people ask me, what did you learn? And I think I'm only sure of one thing. Nobody knows themselves. Sometimes when somebody is really nice to me, I find myself thinking, how would he be in Sobibor? And this is ultimately, I think, the the crux of the social problem that I experience as a disabled trans socialist in 2024. Mm-hmm. Um, like people will kind of like perceive me as like joyless, like, you know, an uptight SJW whenever I don't find something funny. Um, when the reality is like people like us are in we're very aware of the active political danger that we are in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting with, with this quote that I've read, nobody knows themselves. I think that's something that made Joyce from Disco Elysium a very, very interesting character because she's extremely self-aware. Like, when do you when do you meet a self-aware liberal? Basically never. (laughs) You know, there are very few liberals who understand like a socialist analysis, like a, uh, you know, material analysis of the world and then still decide to be liberals. But from her perspective, like she's somebody who would have been, it sounds like she was rooting for, or actually like would have wanted a socialist revolution on a personal level. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But because of her circumstances, she is, financially and socially coerced into maintaining the position that she's at that you know she can have the most good for not just herself but she describes i think having daughters granddaughters maybe also um that their lives would be considerably worse you know she's in martinez and she sees that poverty she wants to hold on to what she has and so i think in a lot of ways, somebody like Joyce, like she must be in a lot of like turmoil and pain to like stuff that part of her away. Right. I don't know. She's, she's a really cool character. I like her a lot. Yes. But, but also a very unrealistic character because I, I think really typically what you see is if someone gets the education and has access to these ideas, this mode of political analysis, I think that they usually end up like internalizing it and becoming like true leftists, right? And I think that's what's so frustrating about liberals is that sometimes they're like, they're like precariously close to getting it, yeah. but they don't. Or sometimes they like, they talk the talk, they'll hear something that a leftist says and they like the sound of it because it aligns with their values, at least like on a social level. And so like you'll see them, you will see liberals sharing 
the first pride was a riot, like be gay, do crimes. You'll see them share that shit, but they don't actually, either they don't mean it or they don't know what it means, you know, because we were talking about in the previous episode in St. Louis at the pride, um, March, the pro Palestine demonstrators, um, blocking the parade. And we had people in the crowd, um, ostensibly, presumably liberals, social progressives who might be the same people who've shared those posts. The first pride was a riot, mm -hmm. be gay, do crime. But when they see the riot happening, the left wing riot right in front of them, they only feel like distaste from it. They, they boo when they see that. Um, man, liberals really drive me completely nuts. I know it's it's a very it's a very old story too. Like a ton of liberals voted for the Iraq War, they were in support of it, and they tell you, "Oh no, it's bad." They'll say it's bad now, but back then, they were all in favor of it. And it was like you know you saw the same thing during like the civil rights movement. Like liberals were very big on like, "Well, we got to be civil. We have to be. We have to have civility politics." Um, and then you you know as time goes on they'll say they'll they'll act like they were in support of like this the civil disobedience, but that wasn't the case at the time. And mm -hmm. and again with like Palestine we see it now like like the liberals now will be criticizing like the the encampments at colleges, um, that are trying to get universities to divest from Israel. And I promise you, I guarantee you, in the future. They'll be like, no, we supported those. <laughs> yeah, how many years? Like five, ten years from now? I don't know. However, however long it takes for them to uh, gain social cred from from virtual signaling. Oliver, or, yeah. Oliver, and I—we both grew up in very conservative areas, and uh, as we kind of established identities for ourselves, we moved from being conservatives into being like liberals and then from then being liberals into leftists. Can you talk a bit about like that, that transition of identities from, from liberal to leftist and, and how like, you know, eventually you reach a point where it's like, okay, I'm abandoning that old identity for this new one. Hmm. You know, I think what's kind of complex about moving from a liberal identity to um, a more left wing, especially a more revolutionary rather than reformist um, identity is that I really think it's a big theme with liberals that they will talk the talk, but they won't walk the walk. And that's kind of the the biggest thing that I notice with with liberals. And and so it can feel very like misleading to spend time with them and then eventually figure out that they are they're not who they say they are. They aren't who they think they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there were a few years where I was identifying as an anarchist. If you asked me what I was, I'd be like. I think anarcho-syndicalism is really based. Um, but at the same time, you know, you'd feel the pressure of the economic and social coercions around you, and it would influence your behavior, where even if you, you might believe um, a certain ideology, you know, it, it's hard to determine, okay, am I acting like this because... I'm actually a liberal or am I acting like this um, because of the coercion, because I'm trying to keep myself safe? Um, and that can also be difficult to identify in other people, right? But I think what I noticed in myself was sort of like a gradual change where I started making my behavior align more with my words and more with my internal beliefs. Um, and I think having a few years of figuring out that, yes, this is going to be very uncomfortable on like a, a you know, a personal, interpersonal like level, um, you know, not not talking about like um, 
the, even like the really big economic coercions. And, you know, if you are a leftist and you have these beliefs, there kind of comes a point where you have to realize, like you said, it's going to cause a lot of friction. And I think the openness to that friction and the acceptance to that friction um, and the willingness and ability to tolerate some of that friction, I think that's whenever when I look back and I say, like, this is when I became a leftist, I think that's probably when right? Because when I was just making posts online or just telling people what I believed, but then letting them trample me, letting them make, you know, horrible decisions on behalf of my community for me and like not stepping up and causing a fuss. Um, I think I was sort of acting as a liberal when I kept my head down in some ways. Um, and, you know, th there's kind of like this whole thing of like you do have to you have to prioritize your safety. Like that's a non-negotiable, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but but it's a pretty complex space to be because so many people become your enemy. If you if you really abide by the things that you believe, it can become very difficult to just get along with the people around you. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like that process looked like for you? It was a lot of like adopting disconnected, but, but related leftist ideas. Um, and it took me a while to get there. It, it, it takes a while, but then, you know, you have little aha moments and, and they kind of click together and you, you kind of, you kind of start seeing like the, the intersectionality of, of, of class analysis and, and of, of transphobia and, you know, well, all that good stuff. Um, you, uh, the pieces start clicking together over time. It really is like when you're actually putting together a, a huge puzzle piece, like a huge puzzle, a thousand piece or whatever. Um, and you get like, you're working on the section of, of like transphobia and you're like, Okay, I think I got this fleshed out. And then you look over at like your misogyny chunk. Yeah. yeah and then you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you put them together and you're like, oh my <gasps> God. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly like that. It's very exciting. And then you're like working on your like capitalism and your classism and you're like putting that. And then like you look at your racism piece over here and you're like, oh, that's the thing that was missing all along. Jesus Christ. I get it. I get it. Yes. Yes, like yes, all yes. of this stuff, it it all <laughs> works together. Yeah. And sometimes I think that's a thing with liberals, right? Mm -hmm. That sometimes they they might have some of the pieces. They're missing pieces. Like for sure, they're not just missing pieces. Um, but I think they're also missing the connections. That these aren't just like mm -hmm. little points to memorize. I noticed that with like interpersonal conflict with liberals, mm -hmm. um, especially like liberals who aren't minorities mm -hmm. they instead of like figuring out okay how can i you know learn about transphobia and learn about cis normativity so that you know my trans friend who i i like and want to keep around how can i you know like what do i do about this to to make them comfortable and and keep them as like keep a good relationship with them instead of like learning, like doing like this historical political analysis, they kind of like memorize talking points, mm -hmm. like usually socially progressive talking points. Okay, most trans people say this. Most, you know, mm -hmm. like this is what's generally accepted. They'll go on, they'll go on r slash ask transgender and be like, hey, I think I said something offensive. Is this okay or not okay? Instead of I don't know, getting, getting the framework. And honestly, like it's frustrating on the level of, um, you know, not just not being able to depend on them for like safety, um, 
But it's also just like, man, why are you not a more curious person? There's so there's so much like deep lore in this world. And like you could understand me and my experiences better. You could be a better friend to me. We could have like a way closer relationship if you investigate this stuff. Um, but like ultimately... I don't even want to say that it's not worth the effort to them because I'm not sure if that's what's going on. I think for a lot of them, they just don't know that this information is out there, that there's more to it, you know? So they end up having like this very shallow surface level understanding of what to say, what not to say, instead of like joining you in challenging these systems. Well, it's the, it's, it's the lack of curiosity that gets me, you know? Like, I'd like to believe that just kind of based on how I analyze information um, and how I come to the conclusions that I do, that I would have I would have been um, like an abolitionist during when when slavery was like widely accepted. But like for the average liberal, you know, they don't they don't have that analysis. Um, they would have just been accepting of slavery when it was widely accepted. Um, I find liberals can be very, very good at like analyzing things um, independently of the wider context. So, so like maybe, maybe, you know, they have a really good uh, understanding of like Reaganomics and they can, they can criticize his, his anti-union policies, but they don't fit it into like a larger class analysis. Like we're like okay, but why did we end up here? Um, and it's just sometimes I just you know like when I used to hang out with liberals more, sometimes I just wanted to like grab them and shake them and be like, no, just think, just extend your thinking a little more, please, beyond beyond where you're at, just a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. and they don't do it and they don't do it. And then there is, you know, like we were talking about earlier, there is that friction where, God, how do I even explain it? It's like, it's like you can see in the dark better than they can <laughs> or something. No, it's I, not I even almost that. wonder. Hmm. So, like, I feel like socialists have hella coolness vibes, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, oh, my God, the, the socialists, they're so dope. Like, we have, like, this self-assuredness. And also, I think because we experience, like, so much alienation, like, social alienation, <clears throat> that I think a lot of us come across as, like, independent, self-sufficient people. Mm-hmm. Um, who like don't budge on our values. Um, and I think to some people, like, I mean, think about, think about call me manana from disco Elysium. Like he has hella, like, yeah. you're just like, that guy is so cool. Right. Yeah, cool. Um, so I almost wonder, like maybe more people will become socialists just after seeing how like cool we are, you know? It's like a like a culture victory in civilization. Because yeah. it's just like, damn, I want to be like that. And and then so they start learning about socialism so they can be like us. Sorry, I'm goof I'm goofing right now. <laughs> That's a fine. Bit. Imagine imagine being like I don't know, like like an like an abolitionist or uh, imagine like being really like pro civil rights and then being in like a context and in a time where like that wouldn't be socially acceptable and you're running into that kind of kind of friction with others around you or like like imagine you're really in favor of like women having universal suffrage and other people being like they're, they're judging you for that and you're kind of you're kind of socially an outcast um you know and then this is this is a thing this is a similar thing that happens now, like last episode when we talked about uh, the, uh, the the, the pro-Palestine protests at the at the Pride Rally and the Pride Parade. Um, like you're going to alienate some people around you by saying, well, we, 
I, I agree with those guys. Um, Sometimes, actually often, I think the lesson to take from this episode, what we're trying to say is that doing the right thing often does not make you more friends. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it makes you like incredible friends and like yeah. incredible allies who believe the same thing as you, mm -hmm. who will like actually have your back mm -hmm. um, when they see what you're doing. And sometimes like there is already somebody like you in that situation and they haven't stepped up yet because they don't see anybody else doing it and they don't feel safe. Right. Do you. Do you think so Oliver and I. We both um, kind of come from like backgrounds where we were socially isolated and kind of like kind of like social outcasts. Do you think being a social outcast kind of helped informed your leftist beliefs where like you got used to this idea of being on on uh, like the outside of what what is popularly accepted, whether whether that just be like socially, or or politically do you think do you think mm -hmm. being a social outcast like set you up later to being a political outcast honestly i think you're probably on to something there a little bit and i feel like you kind of get that vibe from a lot of socialists right yeah um yeah but but i do think like for a lot of people to become a socialist for that to happen to you for you to go through that process and that education um and that like internalization of like new values that were not previously upheld by like anybody that you knew you had to be you had to maintain some kind of distance i think um in order for that process to take place for that metamorphosis to happen right and for me like when we talk about materially what it actually looked like for me to become a leftist i was you know, severely disabled by PTSD and depression, unable to leave my house practically, um, except for like maybe going grocery shopping, <sighs> maybe going on a little hike by myself now and then. And when I was at home, or even if I was like walking around with some earbuds in, I was usually listening to like an audiobook about like anarchism or like you know, maybe maybe some kind of lefty podcast or video essays by socialists and like getting this at like internalizing this stuff. And it was a few years of doing that. Um, and it's it's hard for me to imagine because like we're talking about this social pressure thing. Right. And also economic pressure. Imagine being sort of like a liberal minded, like let's think of today's progressive liberal like socially progressive liberal mm -hmm. and put them in the context of you know 1850s america and if you talk to this the smiling fascist the liberal they will say you know i do think that slavery is wrong but I have a lot of friends who own human beings and they're nice guys, you know, like, well, like my uncle has, has an enslaved person. And, you know, even though I don't think it's great, like, I think it's bad, but like, I still love my uncle. He's been part of my life since I was a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I, I can't just like, what do you want me to do? Shoot him? Like, I can't do that. Then I would be the bad guy. I would be doing violence. And it's like, yes, shoot him. Violence is already happening. Yes. The violence is all already being inflicted on this person. Do you not understand? Yes. Um, I, I think for a lot of liberals, they, they're kind of like insecure people hmm. who are looking at what is normal. How can I be normal? How can I get along and, and like try to get through this world with like as a little conflict and like by not being outcasted, like mm. I don't want to be an outcast. I don't want to be like part of the underground economy. I don't want to be doing illegal things. I just want to get along. I want to, I both want to be a good person and I want to get along with everybody. And it's like, at some point, I think being truly mature like in your identity as a person um and especially as a leftist 
you have to realize you can't do that. That doesn't exist. You don't get to be a good moral person and get along with everybody because a lot of people that you love, hopefully not a lot of them, hopefully little of them. Um, but this is, this is the case for a lot of trans people, you know, trans people figuring out that their parents hate queer people and they'll still be like begging for their acceptance for years and years. Um, and they want to get along with them. They try to find a way to keep their head down. And I think having these experiences where like keeping my head down didn't work over and over and kind of having that lesson beat into me by my experiences like I, I think that was an important part of me becoming a leftist you know I remember you know I had an abortion when I was 19 mm -hmm. due to abuse mm -hmm. and um I remember the way that some people in my community reacted to that whenever I decided to be open about it you know first there was like this overwhelming um force like this social force where it was like this is a thing you don't talk about and it's still like that like i don't know if you notice but like abortion is pretty common it's something like one in three people who can get pregnant will have an abortion in their lifetime very very common but i know so few people who who are open about having an abortion and i'm and i exist in very very um left-wing spaces so, um, you know, the stigma is just like overwhelming. Right. And, um, so I've just had these experiences being a queer person as a teenager, being a trans person coming out in my twenties, um, being disabled and watching the people around me, some of them liberal mm -hmm. react to that in negative ways. Um, and ultimately I had to make the decision, like, who am I? What do I care about? And is it more important than what other people want me to be? How, what other people want me to act like? Is it more important than getting along? Often, yes. Like, is ending slavery more important than getting along with your uncle? Personally, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, that's math you're going to have to do by yourself. Um, but you know, you have to, you have an opportunity to choose, like, do you want to be on the right side of history? Like they, they executed John Brown for being an abolitionist. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be executed anytime soon but people are going to be mad at you for being a socialist and you know you have to decide for yourself like how important are your values really how important is it that we are working towards a better world um and if i have to put an optimistic spin on that because like you know you're gonna you're gonna experience some 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 form of pushback from being a leftist. And you know what? Um, it isn't always going to be like sunshine and roses. You know, I can tell you that from experience. But I take pride in knowing that I'm making the correct moral choices, that I'm acting in line with my beliefs. And when you do that, like... You're going to attract other people who think that same way, you know? Like I was telling Oliver before we started the podcast, like, you know, Oliver and I have been through so much, but like we've also bonded over a lot of our shared trauma um, or our shared uh, uh, experiences of trauma. Um, and we have a stronger friendship for it. Yeah. I don't know, Oliver, what's, what's your optimism of the will for today? So you were talking earlier about how it's not, it's not always going to be sunshine and roses, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the time when we hear about these stories, like of John Brown, for example, mm -hmm. we kind of, we almost think of like, like a hero's story. And like, you know, whenever you're watching that or reading that, um, 
like especially fiction or or an actual history, you kind of like you look at like this information and you like weigh the morality of the behavior. But something that I think we should try to do more often is like sitting down and using your like empathetic imagination to wonder like how does that feel how would it actually feel to come up against this nearly invincible force mm -hmm. it like be in a situation where you think like i might lose i might get imprisoned i might get beaten i might get killed but but I have to do the right thing um, and I'm going to do it or, or otherwise like, you know, if it's not these things, maybe like be socially ostracized, mm -hmm. lose income, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think putting yourself in the shoes of these historical figures and vividly imagining like what that distress felt like, I think that can be like a really important exercise Um to like ready yourself to deal with some of these things that you might deal with because it is, it is really, really scary. I I've told you guys on this podcast, a story about whenever, um, some coworkers and I went up against the company that we were working for, or rather the funders of the nonprofit that we were working for, because we noticed abuse that was happening in this facility. And it was scary as fuck. Um, and it was the kind of anxiety that makes your chest tight, that makes you sweat, that makes your mouth dry, that makes your guts feel like they're trying to evacuate everything in your stomach immediately. Um, it was really, really scary and really, really stressful, but I knew I could do it even though I had an anxiety disorder and I've been struggling with this shit my whole life. I knew I could do it because I wasn't alone. And, you know, my coworkers and I talked about that before the meeting, like, you know, we actually would talk to each other about how we're feeling and giving, we're giving each other emotional support. My coworker was telling me like, I'm probably going to go straight to the psych hospital after this meeting to make sure I'm okay because they were like having shortness of breath and almost sort of like, like, you know, cardiovascular distress you know, um, and, and the way it felt in their body was like really concerning for their health. And, and it was hard. And like, the fact is like, we also did not win in that situation. We did not get the concessions that we were looking for. But when I look at it now, I don't think of it as a failure. I think it was an opportunity for practice. And mm -hmm. I did really well with that practice. And I also think of it as, um, a moment of community building that was also very effective. Um, and, and I also just feel like personally, it was a very great success for me because I did reaffirm my values in that situation. I did the right thing, even though it was scary. And so now I know that I can do that again if I have to, even if I feel like I'm going to actually shit my pants, I know that I can do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the fundamental difference between a leftist and a liberal. The leftist chooses to be brave. Okay. We've been, we've been talking for uh, about 45 minutes, but I think that's pretty good. I think we had a pretty good episode. We are optimism of the will. Uh, yeah, we are. You can follow us at, uh, at OPT of the will on Twitter. And if you like our content, if you like our content, support our Patreon. Give us please money. Please do. We're so poor. Give give us as much money as you can, please. Uh, we're we're disabled trans yes. socialists, <laughs> both of us. We're broke as fuck. We're so broke. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this because I think this was like a really dope episode, honestly. Yeah, this is a dope as hell episode. Okay, thank you everyone for listening to us. Please, uh... Remember, just to like share this video if you like it. Um, also, like 
you can find my Twitter also. I'm not super active, but mm. at trans underscore underscore cat dead. I believe that's my my Twitter handle. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you DM me, I'm sure I'll get on there at some point. I have the same username on Reddit. So if you're ever like, mm. what 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 kind of uh, lefty analysis? What's your what's y'all's opinion? You can you can also just post on the um, OPT of the will. A Twitter, maybe we maybe we can talk about some shit. Yeah, this is just a really fun episode. So absolutely, okay. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, and we will see you next episode, Oliver. Do you have? Do you have your little? You got? Oh, you know what? Yeah. I forgot to ask you for your ten seconds at the beginning. Can you give us your ten seconds and then your catchphrase? Oh, my ten seconds. Um, I tried two jobs this week like two small part-time jobs and one of them really did not work out and i've been busy and stressed as hell um in case you're wondering about how i've been doing i also went to a vampire weekend concert last night and it was incredible and my my signing out phrase that i'll leave you you leave you guys with today is um keep swagging it um along with uh may all your foes be damned May all your roads be short and sweet, and all your stories be glad ones. That's like, it's like the Khajiit greeting in Skyrim. May all your roads bring you to warm sands. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, because they're cats, and it's like a litter box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I just think of my little guy Sebastian in front of the window yes. every morning, soaking up the sun. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.